All right, so we're gonna, yes ma'am. I have to go back and re re grade all of your written responses. So yeah, I'm working on getting all those updated. So I have not done those yet. Um, all right, so we're gonna finish up chapter two and hopefully, fingers crossed, get into a little bit of chapter three today, okay? So chapter two, we're gonna talk, we're just talking about tourism throughout the world. So looking at this graph right here, okay? Look at this graph right here. What market has, the, has experienced the most growth over the last 10 years? So how we read this graph, okay, let's look at this. This is basically right here we have, um, let's look at year 2000 to start, okay? So year 2000, Europe grew by this amount. The Americas, as blue, grew by this amount. East Asia grew by that amount, and so forth, okay? So now looking at this, let's look at 2010. That's a straight line, okay? So in 2010, which one experienced the most growth? Europe, okay? Year over year, Europe is experiencing the most growth in the, for the forecast tourism arrivals, okay? And so these are people that are traveling to Europe. And so we can see the Americas, they're still doing okay, people are still coming to the Americas. So if we are in America, we want to identify what people are coming to us, what groups are not coming to us. We want to start marketing to those groups who are not coming to us. Okay, Europe obviously is doing pretty well, okay? There's a lot of destinations in Europe people want to visit. What are some major destinations in Europe that people want to visit? Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower, and that is in yeah. Paris, good, in France. What else? The Leaning Tower of Pisa, yes, in, in Italy. The Colosseum in Rome. Notre Dame Cathedral was in Paris. It didn't burn down, but it was burnt. It was damaged significantly. That was tragic. How many of you ever been to Notre Dame? Anybody? Oh my gosh, we had an opportunity with the Master Singers. We sang Father's Day, new, the High Noon Mass on Father's Day last year. We sang at that Mass ceremony or that Mass service as the Master Singers. It was incredible. So to see that on fire was very, very devastating. What else? Buckingham Palace, good, in the UK, in London. See, what's that, Big Ben? Good. So you can see this, probably a reason why people are flocking to Europe. There's so many different destinations that uh, people want to go and visit. Um, all right, so the one thing I love about this term right here, interdependence. What does interdependence mean? <laughs> They depend on each other and, oh, as you said, okay, sorry. So they depend on each other. So if more people are traveling by airlines, that means we need more hotels. If people are traveling by airlines, then we need more rental car companies, potentially, okay? We need more food and beverage mm -hmm. um, options. Uh, we need more recreation options. So, but if we don't have recreation options, then our airline may not increase, or may not, our airline service may not increase, right? We don't, we don't have any reason to attract people to come to our areas. Now, in Texas, we have, well, in tourism in general, we have a, a term that's called our drive market, okay? Drive market, what does that sound like? What do you think drive market means? Okay, so it deals with cars. Now let me tell you this. San Antonio's drive market is Houston, Austin, and Dallas. So our drive market for San Antonio is Houston, Austin, and Dallas. So what, is, what do you think drive market means? Yeah, the travel between cities using vehicles. So I'm gonna do a very poor job, real quick, just heads up. Drawing Texas. It's not too bad, okay? 
So San Antonio is right here deep in the heart of Texas, of course, like the best place, okay? So San Antonio is here. Where's Austin? Just a little farther north. Stop doing that. Okay, and then the other one is Dallas up here, DFW, and then we have Houston over here, okay? They're close enough to San Antonio that they can drive. They don't need to fly. They can fly if they don't, if they don't, if they, if they want to. They don't have to, but they're close enough to drive. And so if we notice that our airport is really crazy busy, but the number of tourists really aren't increasing that much, we might look at our drive market. We might actually go and advertise in Dallas and say, hey, come down to San Antonio, come see SeaWorld. You don't have SeaWorld in Dallas, but we have it in San Antonio, okay? Um, so that drive market is something that we can, we can appeal to to get people to come. Um, also, looking at your, your past report, so I was talking to um, somebody a couple years ago, one of the business um, owners downtown. He works for a restaurant on the Riverwalk. And um, he was saying that the year before, 80% of his credit card charges for his restaurant during Labor Day weekend came from zip codes from Houston. 80% of his swiped credit cards came from the Houston zip codes. So they had Hurricane Harvey right before Labor Day. So what does that tell him about his potential Labor Day business? It's going to be really slow, oh, right? Because the year before, now we have now we have Hurricane Harvey. People are at home in Houston oh, taking care of their business. They don't have the time to travel. They don't have the money to travel. Their focus is on getting their life back together, not on going to San Antonio for Labor Day weekend, right? And so understanding where we get our customer base from is also really is also important in understanding predicting our volume of business, okay? So we can market to places that we're not going to get a lot of, we haven't traditionally got a lot of people from, but then at the same time too, if we look and there's natural disasters going on, if the economy is low, um, people don't have as much money to spend, then we're going to see how that affects our tourism, okay? And every one of these, again, rely on each other. That's that concept of interdependency. So our major modes, of, our primary modes of travel, air, rail, automobile, and bus. Does everybody have a little piece of paper? Raise your hand if you do not. One, two, three, four. All right. He gave us two, so I thought we needed two. Pass that down. Here, I'll pass that down. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Oh, one, two, three. Okay. You'll need that in just a moment. Air, rail, automobile, and bus. Okay. So as you as you saw that one graph that saw like how people are tra you know increased uh, traveling and arrivals, tourism arrivals to different destinations or different continents or countries. So essentially, if we're looking at um, travel, we can, we can trace the increase of travel based on technology of how people travel, right? Before, if you, or if you wanted to get from Europe to America, how did you have to travel before airplanes? Oh, By boat, okay? And before the invention of the steam engine that operated those major cruise liners, you were at the mercy of the wind with the sails. If the wind wasn't blowing, your boat wasn't going anywhere, okay? So as technology increased, that gives us the ability to travel and see things um, easier. So now we can easily just get on a plane and fly from here across an ocean, okay? Um, the other thing with technology is now we have this wonderful thing called the internet. And we have one of the wonderful things called social media. You can take a picture and post it within seconds about what you just experienced. And now everybody back home sees what you just experienced. Or you can type in a Google search and you can do an image search for, I don't know, what would you do an image search for, for like for traveling? 
Okay, so you're gonna do an, well, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna look for hotels, maybe like unique hotels in London. So instead of just staying at a Hilton or a Marriott or a Hyatt, you know, you can stay at unique hotels in London. And so now you're gonna get all these additional potential unique, really cool things, uh, hotels you can stay at that are not just a traditional hotel. You can might just say unique hotels across the world. You'll get the ice hotel. You'll get hotels that are like tree houses and you're living literally up into the trees. I mean, things like that that we normally would not have seen, but now because of technology, we have the ability to see those. It inspires us to travel more, okay? So air travel, the thing that I wanna talk about for air travel, um, primarily is the hub and spoke system, okay? Is the hub and spoke system. Have we talked about this yet? A little bit? Okay, cool. So the hub and spoke system, essentially what we can do with the hub and spoke, a hub is a major airport, okay? It's a major airport. Most airlines have at least one hub, if not multiple hubs, okay? And this is what the, spoke, the hub and spoke system looks like. So in this case, Dallas is the hub. Think about the wheel, okay? So Dallas is the hub. Wichita, Fall, Lubbock, College Station, Bryan, Waco, and Tyler. These are all smaller airports. These are all spokes of the wheel, okay? And the spokes will get people to Dallas. So let's say people from Tyler, Waco, Bryan College Station, Lubbock, and Wichita Falls. Let's say there's like five people for each place that need to go to Nashville. Okay? So if I need to go to Nashville, I can't have an airplane that takes off with five people in it to go from Tyler to Nashville. But what I can do is I have a group of 20 people from Tyler that need to go to different destinations and I can send all those 20 people to Dallas. I can send all the people from Bryan College Station to Dallas, and they get on that hub, and they go to their own different airline destinations. And then from Dallas, we'll fly to Nashville. And so, in some people in Tyler, might, that Nashville might be their final destination, okay? But some other people might get on a plane and then go on to Huntsville, Alabama. I can't have a plane that takes off from Tyler to Huntsville, Alabama and be cost effective, okay? So the hub and spoke system gets people from all these outlying cities to these major airports and then out and they can, so this is a better uh, representation of a hub and spoke system, okay? Well, yes. Exactly. Okay. Yep, exactly. So you're basically trying to get everybody to that hub. Okay, so for example, Friday I'm flying to Montreal. I could fly from San Antonio to Montreal. I can't, I don't think there's a direct flight from San Antonio to Montreal. So instead I have to go from San Antonio to Houston and all those people, other people from around the country that are also going to Montreal on that one flight are gonna also come to Houston and we're all gonna go the same flight and go together, okay? Um, so with airport travel, Something that's really crucial in developing the business side, like the corporate travel side, is having a lot of direct flights, okay? Direct or non-stop flights. What is the difference between a direct flight and a non-stop flight? Non-stop sounds like what? You don't stop anywhere, right? I take off in San Antonio, I land in Orlando, Florida. That's a non-stop flight, okay? But if I have a direct flight from San Antonio to Orlando, I might stop in Houston. I still stay on the plane. I don't get off the plane. We just stop, let some people off, let people on, and then we take off again, okay? So that's a direct flight. Uh, <clears throat> and then we have, a, like Dean said, we have connecting flights. So if I have to go to Orlando and I have to get a connecting flight from San Antonio to Houston, and then get off the plane and go to a different plane and go to Orlando, that would be a connecting flight. Yeah, 
Yeah. So it all depends on the flight patterns and the flight, the, 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 all the flight schedules. Absolutely. Because there's sometimes that I'm coming home and it's like, here, I go to Phoenix first. And I'm like, but I'm flying over San Antonio. Like, why do I need to go all the way over to Phoenix to then come home? And it's all about consolidating those flights to make sure that we have full flights. Because just like our hotel rooms, once midnight happens, I can't sell yesterday's room today. I lose that revenue. If there's nobody sleeping in that room, I can't get that, that money back. Same thing with an air, air, uh, airline. Once that flight takes off, I can't just magically inject somebody into a seat mid-flight. Okay? Once that plane takes off, if I haven't sold that seat, that's lost revenue. That's lost money. Okay? So they want to sell the seats. They want to sell the, the, the flights out as much as possible. So we also overbook. Okay? We also overbook so that we can a hope that somebody is going to not show up or somebody's going to cancel their flight at the last minute. And so we overbook it for that reason. And then of course we all know that sometimes that gets us in trouble as a business. You have to ask people to step off the flight. You have to give other kind of incentives and things like that. But hotels, airports, they all do that. Airlines, they all do it. They overbook intentionally so that they can make sure they maximize at 100%, whereas uh, everything's possible. Now, <clears throat> you have to be smart about it. If you're downtown San Antonio and Valentine's Day is on a Saturday, you probably don't want to overbook your hotel by too much because everybody else is probably going to be sold out as well. Okay. Um, rail travel. So rail travel, as we as they introduce air or rail travel, where now we can move large numbers of people via railroads. So it allows us to mass um, send people in big groups across the country. As we introduce the rail travel, remember we talked about the hotels now go from little inns to now they're more centered around the city centers, around where the train station is. So people get off the train and they don't have too far to walk. To get to their hotel okay um so rail travel in the u.s has not really it, it it's available but it's not as prominent as automobiles but in other parts of the world rail travel has definitely taken off there are some very very fast trains out there okay so on your piece of paper i want you to write how fast do you think the fastest train in 2019 that's in operation, how fast, how many miles per hour do you think the fastest train in operation in 2019 travels? You're guessing, yep. Yeah? How fast? You cannot Google it. Cannot Google it. Just write your answer down. Okay. So it's at least 250 miles per hour. Okay. At least 250 miles per hour. It's a little bit higher than that. Um, and so we're going to watch a quick video about rail travel in 2019. You'll find out. <laughs> All right, so future of rail travel. Again, in most other parts of the, country, in the world, rail travel is increasing because it's, it's a, the ability to move a lot of people. <laughs> Think about, I'm not saying that San Antonio needs to get a subway system or San Antonio needs to get a railroad system. Don't quote me on that. Okay, but think about how much traffic can be, um, how much congestion can be alleviated if you have that ability to move people. Think about in New York City, how much traffic there would be on the roads if there was no subway. Okay, with how many, like what, nine, 10 million people living in Manhattan. Okay, 10, 10 times the amount of San Antonians living in one little island. If there was no subway, then think about the congestion that that would create. Okay, so the rail travel definitely has its benefits. Um, when I went to San Francisco back in April for the Rock and Roll Half Marathon, um, I thought it was brilliant 
because the, the, the train actually goes from the airport, the subway goes from the airport into downtown. So there was no reason for me as a traveler to rent a car because I didn't have to get from the airport, which in most cities, the airport is way, way far away in the outskirts of town. San Antonio is pretty fortunate. We have an airport that's minutes from our downtown. Most cities don't have that. Um, and so if I want to go, if I'm traveling somewhere that I typically often have to rent a car or I have to Uber or get a taxi, which can also be pretty cost, um, pretty cost prohibitive. Okay. So automobile travel, that's the main focus of travel um, in the U.S. when a lot of people travel. Why do people travel by automobile? Okay, it's convenient. You have the freedom of your own transportation. Okay, what else? Why, why do some, how many of you like to prefer to travel like road trips or prefer to travel by road? Um, Kaylee, right? Why do you like to travel? Um, so you can see things as you're going. Okay, good. Anybody else? Uh, within the, my family, we always do road trips. So yeah, like she said, we get to see more things. And then we also are kind of in the comfort. We never have to stop anywhere. We pack a cooler and a bunch of snacks. Like just pull over and make a sandwich. There you, know, you go. Everything right there. Yeah, absolutely. So you can pack a cooler. You have all your food available for you. You can just stop on the side, uh, like a rest stop and make a sandwich. Okay, what else? Dean. Okay. Awesome. Anybody else? Yes. You're on your own time, so you can, if you want to stop somewhere, you can. Okay, good. You don't have to mess with airport security. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Absolutely. I mean, so a flight from San Antonio to Dallas is only about 50 minutes, but you've got to get there at least an hour or two in advance, so that's three hours. So really for an hour longer of time, travel time, you could be in Dallas and you could have your own vehicle at your, at your disposal. You don't have to rent a car, all those different things, right? Um, you like to, you can stop. I, I don't know if you like, if you're like me, if I'm driving on the road and I see a sign for something, I'm like, oh, the world's largest strawberry. Yeah, I'll go check that out. Okay. Um, I don't know. I love strawberries. So yeah, I'll check that out. And so, you know, as you're driving, you can do that. If you're on the airplane, you're like, oh, there's a giant strawberry down there. I guess that might be the world's largest strawberry. I don't know. I can't jump off the plane and go check it out for a few moments. Okay. And so traveling on road trips sometimes give you, gives you that. Now, the downside is that you have to have the time, right? It takes me 45 minutes to get to Dallas from San Antonio on an airplane. But it would also take me four and a half hours to drive. That's if I drive the toll road around Austin. It could take me six hours to get to Dallas if there's traffic in Austin. Um, the same thing can be said about the airport. We have delays at the airport too. So there's no like guaranteed, no, um, no issue travel off, you know, um, system. There's always, there's always going to be something that could potentially come up. Um, but so people travel different, um, ways. The other reason why is because it's typically more economical, okay? It's typically more economical to, to drive than fly. It typically costs you less in gas to get somewhere than it does for you to buy an airline ticket, okay? Um, so when you're traveling, how many of you, when you travel, you look at all different types of travel options, okay? And which one do you usually settle on? Is it usually the least expensive one? Mm -hmm. If you have the time, it's usually the least expensive. Okay. So when, back in 014, I guess. I guess that's not 014. 2014. Back in 2014, when I graduated my math, my uh, bachelor's degree at a and San Antonio, I wanted to give myself a graduation <laughs> present. And I wanted to go visit my friend up in Boston. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go visit my friend in Boston. If I drive, that's going to be a lot of miles I got to put on my car. Um, and at that time, 2014, my car was seven years old. So I think it probably had over 200,000 miles at that point. And so I'm like, do I really want to put all these miles on my car? And do I want to drive all this way? Not really. Do I want to fly? Well, if I fly, then I'm going to go from here to Boston and I have to rent a car. Well, actually, no, at first I just thought about renting a car for three weeks and just driving it. But then I was like, that's really expensive. I settled on the Megabus. So on the Megabus... 
I, I think I told you all this. I went from San Antonio to New Orleans, New Orleans to Memphis, Memphis to Chicago, Chicago to New York City, uh, or to Boston, and then Boston to New York. Is that right? Yeah, Boston to New... New York to Boston, sorry. And then I went New York to D.C., to Durham, to Atlanta, to Orlando, down to Miami, and then back up to Orlando, to Atlanta, to Dallas, and home. And all of that would have cost me two, it cost me $250. And it took a lot of time, because it was pretty much the same drive time between cities. I think, uh, it's just I wasn't driving. I was sleeping on the bus, or I was watching movies, or whatever. Okay, um, so it was more cost effective to do it that way. Um, and so typically driving is the least expensive and flying is typically the most expensive, okay? Um, rental cars, how many of you are not over 25 yet? Oh my gosh, I'm so excited for you when you get to be 25 and you get to go actually go and rent cars. It's such a fun experience to rent cars. Any of y'all just rent cars just to rent a car? Yeah, right? I mean, it's like really fun. So right now, this is something you can you can do if you want to, if you're over 25. Um, right now, Enterprise typically has between Labor Day and Memorial Day. So between August and May, they have a 10, they used to, I'm not sure, I haven't checked lately. They used to have a $10 a day rental. Now granted, you have 100 miles total, you can't go over 100 miles. Um, so it's really primarily meant for people that need like in the local area that just need a car for the weekend. Um, for whatever reason. Um, so when I first did that, so it's like 30 bucks and you get to run a car, like a, a new car for the weekend. Like that's fun to me. Um, I don't know if it's fun for you. Um, but the first time I did it, I went up to Dallas in March. I Nobody told me about the 100 mile rule. And so I drove to Dallas. Uh -oh. And it's actually, it's 100 miles a day. So you have 300 miles for the whole weekend, right? And you have to rent Friday and drop off on Monday. Um, so there's all these like guidelines and regulations you have to go through, but so nobody told me about the hundred miles a day limit. So I went to Dallas and I love to drive. My, my truck is 2007. So it's 12 years old and it has 349,000 miles on it. I love to drive. And so I drove to Dallas, I drove all around. I told me went out with my friends. I'm like, I'll drive. I got a rental car. Don't put miles on your car. I got a rental car. I also did the first time ever. I did like pre-purchase the gas in the tank at a really cheap price. And so as I turned my car in, the low gas light came on, but I'm like, I don't need to put gas in it. I already paid for the gas. And so I turned it in with like 10 miles to empty. And then the lady walked out and she got the mileage and she came back in and she's like, did anybody tell you about the 100 mile limit per day? I was like, no. She's like, okay. And then she looked at the gas and she's like, wow, you really got your money's worth out of this car. Uh, so for 30, 30 something bucks, I got a car to Dallas and I put like probably like four or 500 miles on it. So it would have been like 50 cents. I think it's 50 cents a mile over the 300. Um, so luckily I said, nobody told me about that. I swear to you. Otherwise I would have been more um, conscious, uh, aware of that. Um, so luckily she could have been like, I'm sorry, here's a bill for $200. But luckily, she did not do that. Um, and the next time, I was like, okay, cool. Um, airports. Airports typically charge a little bit more on rental cars because there's additional fees. Okay? But not always. Sometimes, if I have to rent a car while I'm here, I live about a mile from the airport. So sometimes, I'll actually check the airport for pricing. And it's cheaper for me to rent a car from the airport than it is to rent a car from the Enterprise down the street. One of the main reasons for that is because... The enterprise at the airport is open on Sundays. Most neighborhood ones aren't, so I don't have to pay for a whole extra day. Um, and so um, if you can, like I said, I live a mile from the airport, so I just Uber to the airport for five bucks, get my rental car, and it saves me a lot of, uh, saves me a lot of money. So don't always discount airports um, if you're looking for rental cars, even just to drive. <clears throat> the four largest rental car companies, Hertz, Avis, National, and Budget. What other enterprise, uh, what other uh, rental car companies can you think of? Enterprise. enterprise. What else? Rent a car. Alamo. Okay, so all of these are different rental car companies. They they play a major role in our industry because people travel to different destinations and then then they, then they need a place or a way to get around. Okay, 
Um, and so oftentimes that's by a rental car. Yes. You work for Avis, okay. Is Hertz or Avis the number one? I think Avis is. It's, it's Avis. Yeah, Avis is number one, then Hertz. Okay, where do you work at Avis? Um, I used to work at the New Braunfels location. Okay. And then I used to go to the airport location. I used to work between both of them. Okay. And you did the, did you work the counter or actually getting people to their vehicles or everything? I did. Did everything. Awesome. So you have like clients that were like top of the line, like the presidential. So you have to get like get them first before you can get like the kind of the usual ones. So uh huh. You have to accept or like, I'm so sorry. But some of them would understand. They're like, oh, we're just here for like a little bit, so it's okay. But like the big companies, like it would be like people that were traveling for business. We would always have to get them like the top of the line cars only because they were like a huge company. Right. So we always have to like make sure the car is detailed very well. We always had to make sure all their gases, like even if it was just off a little bit with gas, they would be like, uh, oh, this is not cool. Like they would like clients will always like, look at that. Yeah. Which I understand because Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Anybody else? Any comments? <laughs> cool. <laughs> So actually the rental car, renting, renting cars is the reason why I have the car that I have today. Um, because last year in October, I went to Denver and I rented, I had my rent, my rent enterprise. I did not even upsell, like nobody upsold me. I went to the little kiosk and I checked in myself and then it said upgrade options. So I'm like, oh, what are my upgrade options? Let me see what it's going to be. And so I scrolled in, and it was beautiful 60-degree weather outside, and it said convertible was $10 more per day. I'm like, oh, for 30 bucks I can drive a convertible? Yes, please. Thank you. And I walked out, and they pulled out and run this Mustang convertible, and I was just like, wow, that's a cool-looking car. So I drove that that weekend. The next weekend, I went to San Diego for a trip for CTA, and um, I rented a Mustang convertible, and a month later... I bought a Mustang convertible. I was like, I can see myself driving one of these things. And a month later, I did. Um, it was, it, so renting cars, sometimes you can find a really cool car that you think, oh, I might like myself driving this car one day. So rental car companies, and then also rental car companies actually sell their vehicles as well. So you can actually look at, and they're typically, you know, they're rotating through their, their, their inventory pretty regularly based on the number of miles the car has and based on the year that the car was made and the model. And so oftentimes you can get some pretty good deals as a local resident purchasing from a rental car. And typically their maintenance is, is pretty well kept up. Bus travel is definitely one of probably the most economical um, and it's very convenient. San Antonio, we do have um, some bus, we have a Greyhound station. We also have an international bus station downtown as well. Um, and then a lot of the cities in the New England area up in the Northeast, they have a lot of different um, bus lines. So they have like Peter Pan bus line. They have mega buses up there. Anybody else think of any of the bus lines besides Greyhound? Anybody from the Northeast area? No? Okay. Cool. But they literally have like giant bus stations that you go to the different gates, if you will, kind of like an airport has gates. The bus station has different stations and you get on the bus and it takes you to your next destination. So a variety of different tourism organizations. They go from international down into the local area. Okay. Each organization has something that they're focusing on. So International Air Transportation Association focuses on what? Air transportation. Air transportation through international, okay? Good. So we always want to make sure that um, these are all different things that if you understand the guidelines, if it's something that you're interested in, these are those additional, these are kind of what I consider non-traditional careers. You could go in and, and as you learn more about the aviation industry, then you can go and work at one of these organizations. These are kind of, I'm just bringing it up just kind of basically and really quick just to kind of give you an idea that there's something else besides if you want to work for the airline industry, you're going to gain experience as a, you know, gate attendant, as someone who's checking in, as somebody who's working on the airplanes. Um, and then eventually you can take all that information, all that knowledge and apply it to how um, it affects different associations and different organizations. 
okay? The World Bank lends money for tourism. The United Nations Development Program. So people that um, want to develop different programs, including tourism, because we know that tourism is big business. Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, okay? So again, kind of helps boost that employment. It kind of helps uh, with that tourism in the area, we can raise the living standards in that particular area. What does domestic mean? More local. Inside the United States, okay? International is outside the United States. Domestic is within the United States. So if I say domestic air travel, where am I going? Somewhere, somewhere in the U.S. If I say international travel, I'm going outside of the U.S., okay? So National Tra Tourism Organization focuses on tourism efforts to the U.S., okay? Um, travel Industry of America, same thing, development of tourism. We have state tourism offices. So there's somebody, there's a department in, in Austin that deals with tourism to the state of Texas. We have the Texas Travel Texas Travel Industry Association, TTIA, is an independent, they're outside the Texas government, but they're an independent organization that helps promote tourism and travel in, uh, in Texas. Okay, Convention and Visitors Bureau is a CVB. Does anybody know what San Antonio's CVB is called? So it has San Antonio in it, okay, and it, the, it, the abbreviation is, so what does this stand for? <laughs> visit San Antonio, yep, so if you go to visitsanantonio.com, that is the website, bless you, that's the website of our Convention and Visitors Bureau. Our Convention and Visitors Bureau, their main responsibility is to promote tourism to our area. So they promote tourism through events, through meetings, and through like just leisure travelers. They want to promote leisure travelers. So oftentimes our CVB will go to these different trade shows in other cities and promote San Antonio as a destination. Um, the CVB also deals a lot with meetings. So if there's going to be a major event in town, um, or if there's going to be a major conference in town, the CVB works with them to make sure that every, everything goes smoothly. Um, so the CVB connects all the local tourism aspects, the restaurants, the entertainment, the attractions, the hotels, to those larger meetings. Yes, sir? Nope, it's the Convention and Visitors Bureau, so it works in the city, okay? Um, smaller towns are going to have a Chamber of Commerce. Um, larger destinations, larger cities are going to have convention and visitors bureaus, okay? It used to be called the San Antonio Convention and Visitors Bureau, SACVB, but they were actual, and they were actually a department within the city, city government, the, the city offices. But about two years ago now, they transitioned to a public-private funded. So the, pri the public part means that they get, I think, $36 million a year from the city, um, and then the other part is they're able to raise money on their own. Whereas before, when they were a city government entity, they couldn't raise any money beyond that $36 million. They were stuck with that budget, okay? Um, so, international travelers to the U.S. will reach over 1.8 billion visitors by 2020. 1.8 billion visitors international through to the U.S., Okay, so tourism is big business. So let me look at, let me look at uh, real quick, this statement right here, one out of 10, is on average throughout the world. Um, in San Antonio, anybody know what the, the, the statistic is for San Antonio? One out of how many work in hospitality and tourism? <laughs> one in seven people work in hospitality. So San, hospitality and tourism is a big industry in San Antonio. And the last thing I wanna talk about is this multiplier effect. Okay, the multiplier effect basically talks about how money is distributed through a community, how tourism dollars are distributed through a community, okay? So essentially, 
somebody injects dollars into the into the economy. So I am traveler, and I come in and I spend $150 on my hotel room, and I go out to eat, and I spend some money on my uh, food. I go to Six Flags, I buy a ticket, okay? Well, the hotel takes that $150, and they have to buy, they have to pay their employees, they have to buy the soap and shampoo for my room, they have to buy the towels, so that money is then sent to the vendors, and the distributors, and the employees. The employees then take that money as a paycheck, and spend that money on necessities in the community, groceries, rent, uh, what else? What else do you spend money on? Bills, school, gas, right? So you're in, so now they take that money and put it back into the community. That's what's called the multiplier effect, right? And so this is how tourism dollars impact a region. Um, different people that promote tourism, okay, so tour operators, they plan major tours, um, and they operate tours, so I'm going to say I want to do a food tour of Italy. I'm a, a food co a company, and a tour company, and I create this food tour, and I market it and sell it to people, and then they will buy that because they want to go do a food tour of Italy. So those tour operators, they operate those tours. The company that we work with with the San Antonio Master Singers, right now they're finalizing a tour for us to go to London in June 2020. And we're going to London, Scotland, and Wales, and we're going to sing in different places. But they basically create this package for us to buy. And they're going to make money off of that package. Okay. Travel agencies, we're all familiar with travel agencies. Okay. Travel corporations. So travel corporations, the biggest one is American Express Travel. So if you are, if you have American Express card, you can actually, they have a travel section that you can qualify for discounts for having that, like belonging to that part of uh, uh, that organization, being a member of that organization. Other travelers that are other people that promote tourism, a corporate travel manager. So major company, what's a major company in San Antonio? A big, big business in San Antonio. USAA, okay? So USAA and HEB, right? People are traveling for those. Whataburger, their corporate headquarters are in San Antonio. Valero, their corporate headquarters are in San Antonio. So those major corporations, they don't, if I have to travel, if I'm working for HEB and I'm a manager and I need to go travel to San Antonio um, for a manager's meeting or whatever, typically there's going to be a corporate travel planner. Someone who manages that corporate travel. I'm not just going to go and make my own reservations. I usually have to go through some kind of system for that because then those corporations can be like Alyssa, right? Okay, like Alyssa said with Avis, if somebody came in for a certain company, they had to give them a top-of-the-line vehicle. They had to make sure everything was perfect because they have that corporate account, right? And so you want to make sure that – so the corporate travel manager – is something else that you can do. So if you really like planning people's travel, if you like working with details and things like that, that's a career opportunity. Um, travel and tour, tour wholesalers, again, they're buying all these, these packages as a, at a wholesale price and then reselling those. Certified travel counselor. Um, what does the book talk about CTC? I think it refers to like travel agents becoming certified travel counselors. That CTC, just like CTA, Certified Tourism Ambassador, which you guys will all get in about a month or so, um, that just shows somebody that you have those credentials, that you've gone through that training process. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can get involved in the, in the development of tourism. The last one, the Destination Management Company, that's what I worked with for about a year. It's called Adventures in San Antonio, and we work primarily with corporate clients. A DMC typically works with corporate clients, and so we worked with them. We had a couple of different clients that we worked with. I worked primarily with the people that came to San Antonio, but my bosses also dealt with people, and they took them to different cities as well um, in that. Okay, so employment is definitely going to continue to improve. So it used to be that San Antonio is one in eight employees employed in, in hospitality. Now it's one in seven. Um, 
ecotourism is definitely going to become more um, people are going to become more aware of ecotourism because we want to make sure that we're utilizing those resources available with the, to the best of our abilities. Well, this is the third point. I put it up here because government recognition of the importance of tourism is so crucial as they pass laws that could potentially affect tourism. Okay, so one of the biggest things that happened in the last like two or three years, you know, anybody not familiar with the bathroom bill? Anybody not familiar with the bathroom bill? Okay, so the bathroom bill was a piece of legislation that was passed in North Carolina first. It was looking like it would potentially pass in Texas. And the bathroom bill basically said, in a nutshell, that you had to use the bathroom uh, according to the gender that you had at birth. Okay, and so the issue with that is that it's a it could it is a discriminatory law. Okay, and so the NCAA, okay, NCAA had the final four in North Carolina, and if they did not um, reject that bill or repeal the bill, but they didn't have. Yeah, then the NCAA was going to pull out their national championship. So San Antonio had the 2018 national championship. Okay, that's like a $136 million economic impact in the city of San Antonio um, in four days. And so the, the economic impact of that. So, yes, morally, it should be rejected because it's discriminatory. It's discriminatory. But on the other side for tourism, how it affects our industry, we want to make sure that people understand that. Now, on a bigger picture, we did about, um, I think it's about three or four years ago now, We ha I had an opportunity to address city council during a city council meeting. And Visit San Antonio created this little program that we did um, to help the city council people recognize that everyone in San Antonio is affected by tourism, okay? I don't, I live in District 9. I don't live in any kind of district that has a major, at the time I lived in District 9. I didn't have any major attraction. I didn't have any major um, tourist anything in my district where I lived, but I worked for a destination management company that paid my bill so I could pay my rent in that district. And so they had basically somebody from every 10, one, of every, one person from every 10 districts get up to address their council person to say, look, yes, I don't have a river walk in my district. Yes, we don't have Six Flags or SeaWorld in your district, but I live in your district. And there's a lot of people, one out of seven people live in your district, work in hospitality. And that's how we pay our bills. That's how we buy the groceries at our grocery store is by our jobs in tourism. And so if you affect, if you pass laws that can negatively impact that, then it could really, it could really affect our way of life and our, um, how, how basically how we live. And so we wanted our city council. Well, what happens is somebody else new gets elected to that city council seat and we have to do all this re-education all over again. So government recognition of the importance of an ongoing process, okay? Um,